recent months, my ESI colleagues and myself have presented our proposals on the future of EU enlargement policy in Brussels and different EU capitals. Let me summarize some of these ideas here. At the core of our proposals is the conviction that it is both possible and urgent to make the tools currently available to the European Union and the European Commission more effective. In particular, a tool that the Commission is already using, the annual assessment of progress, the annual progress reports on all accession countries, which should, in our view, become a much better yardstick to both measure progress and a motor to drive reform. The key for this is to find a way to motivate a serious competition among countries and to mobilize the populations. Enlargement, which doesn't succeed in mobilizing policymakers and civil society, will fail. Enlargement policy, which does mobilize the people, might succeed. Today, most EU policymakers agree that enlargement policy is facing a crisis of confidence on two fronts. On the one hand, among elites and people and societies in the accession countries, from Albania to Bosnia to Turkey. On the other hand, in the publics and parliaments and governments of EU member states. If we look to southeastern Europe, what we see is a growing concern about democracy, the quality of the rule of law, freedom of speech, the quality of justice, economic development, polarization in politics and a sense among people that when they protest, it is no longer to the EU that they look for hope or orientation. It is the people of Ukraine and Moldova that are having the EU flag in their hands when they protest, not the people in Bosnia or Turkey. People are facing, and societies are facing, huge unemployment, the social crisis, and they are losing the faith that EU accession is more than a bureaucratic process, that it can actually transform their societies. At the same time, there is growing radical doubt in some EU member states about enlargement policy. Let me sum it up. The conviction is that in Southeastern Europe, the EU is confronted with weak states, corrupt administrations, deeply troubled economies, which have not created and are not creating more jobs. And that the EU has already admitted too many weak states and should not repeat the mistake. As one senior policymaker told me recently, Kosovo has an EU perspective, but whether it is 10 or 100 years, he couldn't say. Another policymaker said that Turkey might be ready in the year 3000. Or as a senior European journalist told me, EG enlargement should be closed down because, in fact, it is a, a lobby that creates pressure on the EU to repeat a mistake. Can you imagine Albania to be ready anytime soon? This radical doubt which was marginal a few years ago, is rapidly becoming the mainstream in some EU capitals. It is demotivating. It undermines the hard work that is needed. But the only way to overcome it is through transparency and showing concretely how the process can actually work. So what is to be done? Let me look at one area where the EU has found a way to mobilize people, focus reform efforts of elites and convince skeptical member states that reforms were for real. In recent years, this area is visa policy. In the field of visa liberalization, the European Commission prepared very detailed roadmaps which set out very concrete conditions, up to 50, not only laws to be adopted, but institutions to be built, police and civil servants to be retrained, investments to be made, results to be achieved. The assessment of progress was strict, fair, and transparent. It involved the Commission and Member States. It was possible to measure progress over time, and it was possible to compare countries. And this produced some very interesting dynamics. Because the Commission's assessments were precise on each of the conditions, whether it was fully met, largely met, or not yet met, it was possible to compare countries' performance in great detail. It was possible for civil society to put pressure on politicians, to focus on the reforms that still needed to be done. It was possible to produce scorecards. And these scorecards showed, after one year of visa liberalization implementation, that three countries were ahead, and two countries, Bosnia and Albania, were behind, which in turn led to 
a focus on what needed to be done and a reform effort both in Bosnia and Albania that made these countries meet the conditions by the end of 2010. This process of stimulating creative competition, a positive regatta, can be copied. Imagine that current progress reports in the chapters that discuss specific policy fields, the 33 chapters from procurement to food safety, from the environment to rural development, from statistics to uh, public finance management, that in all those specific areas, the Commission would prepare a set of the core acquis roadmaps per chapter that would be given to each country and that would be assessed with the same precision as was done in the visa roadmap. And that would allow civil society to identify in which field, which ministry, which administration is falling behind. That would allow countries to be compared. That would allow the media to play the role of watchdog more effectively than now. That would increase interest in the progress reports and would make people read them. Now, why should elites do that? I've talked about visa. Let me now talk about PISA. PISA is, of course, the test that another institution, the OECD uh, outfit, an international organization of economists uh, based in Paris, has devised to change global debate on the education policies pursued by national countries. PISA does not promise any rewards. There is no money. But what it does is it creates measures for benchmarking, for comparison, for competition, for ranking countries. At the same time, a sufficient detail on the performance of 15-year-olds in science, mathematics, or reading in meeting problems that allows policymakers to have specific debates on the future of education policy. If this has worked for the OECD and PISA, it can also work for the European Commission and the progress reports. So how does this relate to what the European Commission is currently already doing? Now, it relates very well because the Commission already produces these progress reports on all countries and it already assesses all fields. In those progress reports, in the year 2013, in each chapter, the Commission came up with an assessment, both of what was done, progress, and how far the country had come in terms of alignment with EU standards. This allowed us, for example, to produce a table and to compare how countries were doing in 2013 in terms of progress, or more importantly, in terms of having reached or having come closer to EU standards. Look at the table for 2013 and you see some surprises. Turkey is first, but Macedonia comes second. Serbia, which has open accession talks, unlike Macedonia, is third, ahead of Montenegro, and Albania is last. These kind of tables already might serve to increase more interest, but the key is the specific detail in each policy field. Imagine if one could do these comparisons in public procurement, environment, food safety, other areas of EU accession policy. This detail would allow the media to identify reformers and laggards. It would identify and allow civil society to work specifically on putting pressure on policymakers to catch up. How does this now relate to the architecture of accession? The process devised by member states of moving countries up a ladder, potential candidate, candidate, opening talks, opening a chapter, and in the end closing a chapter. Well, it relates very well. It is complementary. It doesn't actually replace these steps. But what it does do is it focuses attention back to what really counts, which is results in the field. Currently, the measure that the media and a lot of debates on enlargement use is how many chapters are opened. But as we found out, looking at the case of Turkey and other previous accession candidates, whether a chapter is open or closed does not actually tell you anything about the progress made. If you look at 2013 again, the Commission's own assessments for Turkey will show you that in the opened 14 chapters, Turkey made good progress in two. In the closed 19 chapters, Turkey made good progress in five. So if I'm a Turkish citizen 
to hear that a chapter is open doesn't actually tell me that something good is going to happen. And the same is true for alignment. Many of the chapters which Turkey had opened, there is uh, little alignment. And in as many chapters that Turkey has not opened, there is alignment. Now, what comes, what follows from this is that we need the focus of the debate not on the chapters, but on the substance. Croatia opened and closed many of its chapters in the last year. In fact, this is the key to success in enlargement and to convincing skeptical member states and to convincing the public that this is not just a bureaucratic game, to focus on what it takes to actually achieve the reforms. Let me conclude. The Commission's progress reports exist today. There is no need to change overall policy. In fact, it becomes possible to have a similar, the same approach in a positive way because it incentivizes competition for all the countries that are aspiring to accession. There is, however, an urgent need to improve effectiveness, to focus less on the bureaucratic measures of opening and closing chapters than on the substance of reforms. The annual progress reports should be the key tool to assess past progress. They should be the key tool to define precisely the future reform agenda. They should mobilize all constituencies and they should reassure and convince member states that the process is strict and fair. They should educate the wider public about the substance of European reforms and they should start doing so as soon as possible.